Grace is greater. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, grace is greater. Grace is powerful enough to erase your guilt. Grace is big enough to cover your shame. Grace is real enough to heal your relationships. Grace is strong enough to hold you up when you're weak. Grace is sweet enough to cure your bitterness. Grace is satisfying enough to deal with your disappointment. And grace is beautiful enough to redeem your brokenness. Grace is always greater, no matter what. Well, good morning. So good to see you this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to 2 Samuel, the Old Testament? 2 Samuel, beginning in chapter 9. We're going to read that entire chapter together here in just a moment. As we are just two messages left in our series, Grace is Greater. I don't know about you, but this, this series has ministered to me in some wonderful ways. I've heard from some of you. I'd love to hear that. It's always encouraging. Uh, it's, lo- it's always good to know what God is doing in your life. And we don't usually have a lot of time to figure all those things out. And so if you have time, shoot me an email, brad at pedalfbc.com. I'd love to know what the Lord has been speaking to your heart uh, through this series. We talk about grace is great. Before we get there, we've got 82 more connections. That gives us for August 200, and if I added right, 268 connections, which gives a grand total so far through eight months, 1,789 connections. That is absolutely amazing. So let's celebrate together. Fantastic. We pray those continue. By the end of September, we should be over 2,000. That's exciting to see. We began this journey back in January, which seems like with this heat like years ago. Uh, Yesterday, hottest day on record, 107 degrees. Some of us baked like a panther last night, but a big win. That was a fun fun night last night, and uh, if you didn't want to come sweat, we'll do a tailgate again, have no fear. Uh, but, uh, man, if that was a weight loss plan on, based off number of pounds sweated, I would have definitely lost about 10 pounds, that's for sure. Well, so glad that you're here. I'm excited about what the Lord has for us this morning. We've been talking about the last several weeks together about how grace is greater than our hurts, how grace is greater than our mistakes. We all need to know and experience the grace of God. That which we cannot earn, that which we so desperately need, grace. Our verse, our theme verse for this whole series is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. It says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. That's why our mission says that we're called to engage people with the hope of the gospel, to see lives transformed. You see, we don't want anyone, anyone that is living in Petal, Mississippi, that's living in the state of Mississippi, that's living in North America and to the uttermost parts of the earth to miss out on the grace of God. For consider for a moment, would you, where would you be? Have you ever stopped to consider where would you be were it not for the grace of God? Where would your life have turned out? Where would you be? This morning I want to talk about this idea of grace that is greater than our circumstances. There are things that happen to us in life, many of which, in fact, most of which we don't have, it seems like, a lot of control over. There are certainly some things that we do have control over, but by and large, many of those things are things that happen in life. I want us to look at a Bible character in a moment, perhaps one you may have never, ever heard of, because his name is really, really hard to pronounce. But it's a powerful story. In fact, one commentator says it's the greatest picture of grace in the entire Old Testament. You know, all of us at certain seasons walk through difficulties. Life, maybe as you look at it right now, hasn't turned out like you planned. Maybe like you dreamed. Maybe like that you had imagined in your mind and heart. Maybe as a child, as a teenager, or even as a young adult, you look on your life and you think, man... This is not what I thought. And sometimes when we get in those kinds of moments, it can bring about moments of of great disappointment, even disillusionment. And I've seen people get to the point of even despair over life's circumstances. But I want to encourage you this morning. And listen, I believe this with all of my heart. Grace is greater, even in your circumstances. 
We see this in the life of a guy by the name of Mephibosheth. Now say that four times really, really fast and your tongue will get completely tied. A guy by the name of Mephibosheth. The guy you'll recognize when we read the text moment is the guy by the name of King David. We all know him very well, but many of us may not know the story of Mephibosheth. But I want us to dive in and see what happens when grace, watch this, runs smack dab into the face and the life of Mephibosheth. Here's what I've been praying this week for you. And I've been praying the same for, this, for me all week long. Here it is. That today in this moment, some of you, for the very first time, or maybe in a really long time, will run smack dab into the grace of God. And it will do exactly what it did for Mephibosheth and change your life forever. You see, the reality is your hurts don't have to define your life, nor do your mistakes, nor do the circumstances of your life. It's all about grace. I want you to look as we read this story in a moment between the parallels between Mephibosheth and you and between God or Christ and King David and see what we find here in the text. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, let's stand together on a reading of God's Word. I want us to look at just a few truths this morning, three thoughts we look at this morning. Chapter 9, beginning in verse number 1. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show, show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, Is there not anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, who is crippled in both feet. And so the king said to him, Where is he? And Zippa said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Emil in Lodabar. And the king David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Emil from Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself, laid himself out flat. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. And David said to him, listen to these words. Do not fear. For I will surely show you kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul and you shall eat at my table regularly. And again, he prostrated himself and said, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? And the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands, his servant, so your servant will do. And so Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. And so Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. He says it twice. Now he was lame in both feet. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, we open your word. Father, a story written thousands and thousands of years ago. But it is just as real and as relevant as the day it happened and that it was written about. God, some of us in the room this morning come with circumstances. We find ourselves lame. Maybe not physically, but mentally or emotionally or maybe even spiritually. We look at the circumstances of our lives and we're forced to look and be reminded of what we just sung about. Lord, you have never failed us, period. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Well, the reality is if we stop long enough, we'll look and see that the goodness of God is all over our 
lives. But I pray for the one this morning, Lord, that has never seen your goodness and experienced it. That today, for the first time, they would say yes to grace. For others in the room, they've, they are, they've known that grace, but they've lost sight of it. They've forgotten it. The circumstances of their life have overwhelmed them to the point where it's hard to see you. But God, would you peel back those circumstances and let them see you afresh and anew. And let them know that grace is greater no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Three thoughts I want us to share with us this morning looking at the life of Mephibosheth and the life of David woven together. The first one we see this morning is Mephibosheth's circumstances where he found himself left him in some very difficult places. But in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, we have some understanding, a little bit of background about Mephibosheth and how he got there. In one verse, his whole life changes. Look, if you will, at 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, says this. Now Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son crippled in his feet. For when he was five years old, when the report of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it happened that in a hurry to flee, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. We notice that really in the end, we notice that Mephibosheth is actually a prince. He was second in line to become the next king of Israel if the way that normal kings would happen in the eastern world at that time. For it would pass down from son to grandson. Jonathan was the crown prince. He was to be the king. Yet Jonathan knew and understood that David was to be the next king. But nonetheless... As he grew older, he came to understand that he was second in line to the throne. In one sweeping moment, his life was forever changed. Nothing he did, nothing that he deserved, nothing that happened that was in his control, he's dropped by some well-meaning person, didn't mean to, and because of that fall, he was crippled and lame and could not walk. More than likely had crutches in order to help him be able to walk through life. Don't you think as he got older and by the point this story is written, he thought, you know, my life could have been different. You know, if that hadn't happened to me, my life would have turned out a little bit differently. Maybe he found himself disillusioned over the God of Israel. Maybe he found himself in a place where he wondered about his family. And maybe he didn't really like King David a whole lot. Maybe you've been there before. In an instant, life changes. And the question is, not can we change our circumstances, but what do we do with about the hand that we are dealt? We come back to the same word. We come back to the truth that grace is greater. We notice five things about Mephibosheth's circumstances. Number one, notice this. It says he was hapless, which means that some would say he was unlucky. Unfortunate might be the case. In other words, he didn't deserve what happened. It was an accident. Life wasn't fair if he would have said it. I could be living my best life, living in a, in a, in a palace, heading to be the next king of Israel. And think about it for him. In one fell swoop, his father and grandfather were killed, and he's left. Secondly, he was helpless. He was completely helpless. Ever felt that way before? He was powerless and defenseless. In this time when a person was crippled like this, they were completely dependent on somebody else for their survival. They were not looked upon kindly in that day and age. They were not looked upon as as special like so many times we see people perhaps like that now, more so than ever before anyway. He was weak. He often had to have wondered maybe, would God ever heal him or change the circumstances of his life? He was weak. You know, Paul wanted the same thing in 2 Corinthians where he says, I pray the Lord to remove this thorn from my flesh, this weakness that is constantly attacking me and and belaboring me and, and, and beleaguering me and causing me such problems. And he came to the end where God chose not to take it away. But here's what Paul says. But I came to learn that God's grace was sufficient. It was enough. God's grace was greater. He was helpless. 
He became a fugitive as a result of who his parent and his grandparents were. He was hapless. He was helpless. Thirdly, he was homeless. At one point, he was living in the lap of luxury. He was the son of the crown prince. He had everything at his disposal, everything to eat, anything he could have ever wanted as a child and would have had had he have grown up and been an adult. And his son, his father, would have been king if that would have happened. But in that moment, he loses his property, right? The next king comes in and automatically the king inherits that property, becomes his. So he really has nothing. He's completely destitute and desperate. He relies on on the kindness of a stranger that lived outside of Israel. And there is where he lived with him. Fourthly, don't you imagine at this point in his life that he's hopeless? That nothing's going to change for him? He's lost. He's living in exile. He's crippled. He's in need of other help just to even survive. Maybe he's gone to the place of complete and total despair. He just lost all hope. Maybe you're not there, but listen to me carefully. There are people in your life and in your world who are overwhelmed and have lost hope. I talked to somebody this week and had not seen them in a while. I got to have a conversation with them. And I discovered, I didn't know kind of what was going on in their life. They began to tell me what was going on. And listen, they were on the edge. Life was hard. It is hard for them in this moment. And it was so beautiful to be able to share just a little bit of my message with them and say, listen, just remember, grace is greater. There is hope. God will not fail you. He hasn't yet, nor will he ever. Maybe you're hearing this message this morning because somebody you're going to come and encounter this week needs to know that grace is greater. The last one, he was horizonless. What do I mean by that? Well, we look on the horizon of the direction where we're going. Now, he was directionless. What does he do? I mean, he, was a, he was still technically a prince, but not really anymore. And what was he to do with his life? And he was crippled. He couldn't probably have a job. Where does he go? What does his future hold? And as we think about these five things, and I think about you and me, here's the reality. This is exactly who we are without Jesus. This is where sin leaves us, hapless and helpless and homeless and hopeless and horizonless. For some of you that are lost this morning, And you don't know where you're going. Great news. Jesus knows. And he wants to extend his grace to you this morning. That you don't have to live like this. Out in the wilderness, hopeless and helpless, you can come to Jesus. For others of us in the room, maybe you've in that place because you have a weakness, a physical ailment, a circumstance, something happening in your life that's caused you to feel helpless and maybe even hopeless. What are you to do? Where do you go? We're going to look back in the text and see. Here's the reality. God's grace is enough. It is greater. What do we see next about David? Well, let's turn just quickly back to 1 Samuel chapter 20 and see and understand why David did what he did. Why did David do this? He didn't have to. He wasn't required to. What do we see? Notice what we see in two places we see where David makes a covenant. This is Jonathan speaking to David. This is Saul's son, again, who would have been the heir apparent, but Jonathan knew that God had orchestrated David to be the next king. And look what he says. If I'm still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? And you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him. Because he loved him as he loved his own life. Verse 42 of that same chapter. Jonathan said to David, Go in safety inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. Then he rose and departed while Jonathan went into the city. And he didn't see Jonathan really very much after this point. Jump over to chapter 24. Listen to what Jonathan says one more time. Now behold, I know 
Jonathan says that you surely will be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. So now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's household. Powerful words. David would want to do this because remember the story. Saul tried to kill David on multiple occasions. In fact, he spent the, many of his last years pursuing Saul or pursuing David. Rather, Saul pursuing him, trying even to kill him. And so Jonathan is pleading, don't do what other kings do and wipe out the rest of my father's household. But that could be in your prerogative and God's going to take care of any enemy that would stand against David. But would you show kindness the same word we see David use in 2 Samuel chapter 9, the word hesed, that loving faithfulness of God. Will you show that grace to my family? And David does exactly that as we saw in the text. Five things we see David do. Number one, he remembers his promise to both Jonathan and even to King Saul. He made a covenant to keep it. And there were no qualifications. There were no small print, no fine print, right? I will do it no matter what. No matter what anybody else does or even what somebody would offer to David. He said, I will keep my covenant. And it wasn't based on what Mephibosheth could offer or give to him. He simply said, I will do this because I made a covenant with my friend and maybe understanding even with God. David had been given great grace by the Lord. Listen, David was the only one who could show the grace and kindness that Mephibosheth needed. And because of that, because the king of kings had been gracious to David, how could he not offer the grace? to Mephibosheth. Secondly, he responds to the promise, I love this, with no prerequisites. He doesn't ask, is there, a, is there a descendant that is worthy, that is qualified? He just simply asks, is there anybody that can be a recipient of my grace? David offers unconditional love and acceptance. It probably didn't look good, just to be honest with you, from what the modern-day kings would allow for a, a person to be seated at the table with a king who was crippled. But David didn't care. David didn't care that Mephibosheth could offer him nothing. No real service. But that didn't matter to David. Notice number three. He rescued him. Oh, I love this. Don't miss this part. This is so good. Did you notice Mephibosheth does not go seeking after David? He doesn't go and remind Jonathan of a covenant maybe that he heard about from somebody else. The Bible says that David sought him out. Hey, great news this morning. If you don't know Christ Jesus as your Savior and Lord, He is seeking you out. For those of you who know Christ, remember the day when He sought you out? And maybe you've forgotten, but this morning he is seeking you out this morning. And he requires that he be brought to him. He's living out in that desert, that barren, obscure field. And David says, bring him to me. And the number four we see, he restores what once was his. The Bible tells us here, he gives him back the land. David gives him the land that belonged to King Saul. Even though it was all technically David's, and David could do whatever he wanted to do with it, David chose grace. He gives it back to one who couldn't earn it, nor who technically deserved it by the custom of the day. But he does it because of his covenant and his promise. Number five, he releases grace instead of judgment. Number four, sorry, he releases grace instead of judgment. Or justice. Again, we mentioned it. Most of the kings, what did they do? They killed all of the king's family to prevent a rebellion later on down the road. Some commentators do say that perhaps this is why he was trying to find out was there anybody left? This was years into his reign, so I find that incredibly doubtful. Number one, and number two, the reality is how he treats him would give you no indication 
This is why David was seeking him out. And then lastly, I love this, don't miss this. He regarded him as one of his own. This is so good. Now, if you know the story of David, there was a moment one time we know recorded where David was eating at the king's table. And Saul became enraged at David. And he takes a spear and throws it at David sitting at the table. Why would David ever want to invite a relative of Saul to eat at his table? One word. Grace. The Bible says, not once, but twice, that Mephibosheth ate at the king's table daily. What? As one of his sons. He adopted him. Along with his generals and his sons, there they sat and ate together. And David turns the king's table around What once had been a place of potential murder for David now becomes a place of life and grace for Mephibosheth. Now lastly, what was Mephibosheth's reaction or what what does he do in his moment of grace? Which leads us to the next question for us. What do we do? Christ is represented here by King David and his response to you and to me. He remembers his promise he made to us. He responds with no prerequisites other than we surrender our heart and life to him. He rescues and restores us. He releases grace instead of judgment. And he regards us as one of his own children. What are we to do? What is Mephibosheth to do? Notice lastly, if we're going to see grace be greater than our circumstances, Look look what Mephibosheth does. Number one, his reaction was that of fear and shock. I mean, who could blame Mephibosheth for a moment, right? I mean, what was David wanting him to do? Why did he want to call him before him? Again, he knew. Mephibosheth knew that there was a potential that David was going to take his life. And on top of that, he could offer nothing to David. So he comes with a sense of fear and trembling before David. He had a wife and a son by this point. He was concerned for them too. Notice his reply was that of one of humility. He doesn't try to lay out his resume. He doesn't try to lay out all the reasons why David should let him live. He doesn't demand that David should let him live. He wasn't defiant or rebellious or who are you to tell me anything. Instead, he comes with great humility. The right way to approach our king is with reverence and with humility that I don't deserve this. Number three, he realized his unworthiness. What does he say in the text? I am a dead dog. Whenever I hear that term, this picture comes into my mind of a dead dog. We were in Kathmandu, Nepal. I was on a trip there. And we were headed to a training to meet some folks at a training. And it was in Nepal about the temperature it was yesterday. No air conditioning anywhere to go and find relief from. It was so hot. And a dog the day before had died. But nobody usually messes with animals like that because they're considered where somebody can be reincarnated in the Hindu religion. And so you imagine that dog sitting in that kind of heat. For more than a day, and now two days, we come back the next day. You walked on the other side of the street and held your nose like this, and any part of your body you could cover to try to stop the smell, you couldn't even do it. It was so bad. I think about that dead dog, and I think about what Mephibosheth was saying to David. I'm just like a dead dog. I'm not even worthy to approach your throne. 
I'm powerless. I'm helpless. I'm crippled. I'm hopeless. I can offer you nothing. Listen, our culture in, our, in America teaches us that we've got to offer somebody something in order for them to love us or accept us. Listen, that's never, ever what the gospel teaches. Grace says it has nothing to do with who you are. It has nothing to do with where you grew up. It has nothing to do with who your parents are, what side of the train tracks you may or may not live on, how much money you do or do not have, how much you may have grown up in church or not, or how religious or not you are. He says grace is enough. That's good news this morning, friend. I'm glad I'm one at least that believes that. We, we can't amen from time to time, which means, yes, I agree with that statement. Nobody wants to be called a sinner. I'm not that bad preacher. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that horrible. I'm not like this or that person. And we realize that we're unworthy. Lastly, he responds with thankfulness. He was so incredibly grateful. No doubt his life in this moment was completely changed in an instant. From a moment of wilderness and hardly anything to eat to a place at the king's table. Despair turns to joy. Hopelessness turns to hope. Circumstances are changed. But please don't forget, it ends in verse 13, that he was still lame. Please, I, 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 the author, I believe, had these words at the very end for this very reason. Sometimes our prayer is, God changed my circumstances. And God did answer part of his prayer. No doubt. But he was still lame. And just maybe every time the Mephibosheth got on those crutches, we see that he receives, lastly, the gift. He received the gift. And he's on those crutches. He's approaching back to the table every time. He's not thinking, well, I don't deserve this or even I just should even be a part of this. Instead, his disability was a reminder of the grace and the mercy of God. I'm in the palace of a king. You see, God's gift, grace, it is priceless. It is limitless. It is endless. It is relentless. It is changeless. It is measureless, reckless, and tireless. That is the grace of God. As we close this morning, a story I want to share with you as we close. In 1921, a missionary couple from Sweden by the name of David and Zvi Flood went with their two-year-old son into the heart of Africa in what was called the Belgian Congo. They met up with another missionary couple there, and the four of them decided to take the gospel to a remote place where people had never heard about Jesus. Unfortunately, when they got there, the chief of the tribe would not even let them live near the village. They were forced to live miles away, and their only contact with anyone from the village was one young boy whom the chief allowed to come and sell them food. Eventually, David leads this young boy to faith in Christ, but that was their only convert. They never had any contact with anyone else in the village. Eventually, the other couple had to leave because they contracted malaria, and the floods were on their own. Soon, his wife, who was pregnant, contracted malaria also, and she died several days after giving birth. 
David dug a grave, buried his 27-year-old wife, and went back to the main mission station there in Africa, gave his newborn baby girl to the missionaries and said, I'm going back to Sweden. I've lost my life, my wife, and I obviously cannot take care of this baby. God has ruined my life. He took his son and left and went back to Sweden. The missionaries there adopted the baby daughter and brought her back to the United States. I tell you this story because we oftentimes think that missionaries and preachers never struggle with circumstances of life and despair. But they do. That daughter, her name was Aggie. She grew up in the United States with these missionary parents, and one day, for some reason, she checked her mailbox, and she found, for some unknown reason, a Swedish magazine. She flipped through the photos, and there was a photo that stopped her heart cold. It was a picture of a crude, grave, white cross on top of the grave, and on the cross was written the name Zvi Flood. She recognized it was her mother's name, and so she found and worked to find somebody to translate the story. And as she sat and listened to the story about her work, the mother, her mother had done as a missionary. Sometime later, she traveled to Sweden to find her father. Turns out he had remarried and fathered four more children and basically had ruined his life with alcohol. After an emotional meeting with her half-siblings, She brought the subject of seeing her father, and they said, you don't want to talk to him. He's very ill. You need to know whenever he hears the name of God, he flies into a rage. But Aggie wasn't deterred. She approached the 73-year-old man who had deserted her years before, and as soon as she said, Papa, he began to cry and apologize profusely. She smiled and she said, it's all right, Papa. God took care of me. And instantly he stiffened and his tears stopped. He said, God forgot all of us. Our lives have been like this because of God. Papa, Aggie said, I've got a story I have to tell you. And it's a true story. The little boy you and Mama led to the Lord grew up to lead his entire village to faith in Jesus. And this one, the one seed planted to continue to grow and to grow. And today, he told, she told her father, there are more than 600 African people serving the Lord because you were faithful to the call of God in your life. You didn't go to Africa in vain. Mama didn't die in vain. Papa, Jesus loves you. He never hated you. David was stunned at what he heard. And by the end of that day, the God who he had resented for all those decades, he turned his heart back to Jesus. And just a few weeks later, he walked into heaven. Dear friends, grace is greater than no matter what. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit in these precious, holy, sacred moments that you would do your work as we come to the most important time of our service together, the invitation. Lord, you have been working mightily in these times together. Lord, I know privately, but also even publicly. For some to come for the very first time and say, yes, I need the grace of God. That the, God's grace is greater than anything I'm walking through in my life. For some, Lord, they need to come to you and admit to you that they are a sinner. And ask you to forgive them of all their sins. They need to come like Mephibosheth did. And say, Lord, I'm helpless. I am hopeless. I am nothing without you. They need to come humbly and admit to you who they are without you. And Lord, you're waiting Lord, they would say to you, Lord, I believe that you're the Son of God who loved me and gave your life for me on that cross. And that you died and rose again for me. 
And today I want to confess you as my Savior. I cannot save myself. And I want to commit my life to you as the Lord for the rest of my days. Oh, dear friend, don't miss the grace of God that is running after you this morning. For others of us in this room this morning or watching online, listen to my heart this morning. For some of you, you're just like David Flood. Life hasn't turned out like you planned. Maybe it's because of some choices that you've made or maybe the circumstances of your life have turned out the way they have. But you've been reminded this morning that grace is greater. And it's not in vain what you've done and where you are. And you need to turn to the Lord and see the smile of God and the grace that He wants to extend into your life today. But you have a choice to make. You can walk out this door and say, maybe later, maybe another day. Or you can say, no, today I'm going to run to grace. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. You simply have to come. And He is waiting for you. Lord, in these moments, would you move in power and in truth? Lord, as we worship and respond through singing, as we lift this hymn from one, Lord, whose circumstances were tragic and horrible, but yet the cry of his heart to sing grace is greater was to able to say, Lord, it is well with my soul. Lord, for one, it is not well with their soul. May they make it right with you in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you